Welcome to Wichita Liberty TV with Bob Weeks. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and politics. We're broadcast on KGPT Channel 26 and its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me from my blog, The Voice for Liberty, at wichitaliberty.org. The motto there is Individual Liberty, Limited Government, and Free Markets in Wichita and Kansas. So I mostly cover Wichita, Sedgwick County, and Kansas, although with some of the national events taking place, it's hard sometimes to keep the focus on local. So I cover things that may not be covered by the Wichita Eagle or other television stations or radio, or if we do cover the same news, I'll do it from the perspective of economic freedom, limited government, and individual liberty, as these are the things that are really important, and these are the things that are so often under attack by our government, be it federal, state, or local. So please visit wichitaliberty.org. You can subscribe to the email newsletter I send a couple times a week, and if you want to contact me, you can find my email address and telephone there, or it's simple to remember, bob.weeks at gmail.com. Recently, the Atlas Network and Students for Liberty published a new book titled Why Liberty, edited by one of my favorite people, Tom G. Palmer. Let's let him introduce this book. This generation is a generation that's standing up for something that's surprising to their elders. They're standing up for personal responsibility. The Atlas Network and Students for Liberty have just released Why Liberty, the fourth book in an annual series edited by Dr. Tom G. Palmer. We sat down with Dr. Palmer to learn more about the new book. Why Liberty was conceived in a way like a snack box for the mind. We wanted to put together a series of short essays. You can read one, you don't have to read them all, but everyone could get something out of the book. It's an introductory book about the promise of liberty. And that's the key to it, is it's short, sweet, concise. It's not a big, heavy treatise. Anyone can benefit from this book. A key message in Why Liberty is the idea of the presumption of liberty. A lot of people look at the world and they say, Prove to me why you should have rights. Prove to me why you should be free to do things. And I think, and my co-authors think, that's the wrong way to put it. Prove why other people should have the power to dictate the choices in your life. Most of the authors are very young people, and so I commissioned articles by people who are either in college today or recently out of college. My job as the editor was to commission them and to help them find their voice to articulate very advanced ideas in clear and plain language, which is what the book is about. One of the writers, Olamayo Okedaran, is a Students for Liberty leader in Nigeria, and he has responsibility for a big part of the world, uh, much of Africa. He's a very sharp young man. He just graduated from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, and he's very outspoken about liberty. What he invites us to do is fellow Africans, but everyone, is to see the world with open eyes, to look around us and see that the poor people of the world have entrepreneurship. They have visions and dreams for their lives. What they like is freedom to be able to realize it. What they need is to free enterprise in Africa and elsewhere. Sometimes it's a little depressing when you look at politics. Government just seems to get bigger and bigger. But then go meet the Students for Liberty and the young people involved in this movement. They have so much energy and they know what is at stake. This is, in a way, the most mature generation we've seen in a long time. People who say, I want the freedom to run my life, and I demand the responsibility for it as well. The book is available at atlasnetwork.org for students who want to get multiple copies for college campuses and distribution, high schools and colleges, studentsforliberty.org. And that's a great place to find all kinds of other resources for students as well. You can order copies for your literature table, for a club, for a discussion group. Uh, they make them available to people. There's already 350,000 copies in English. And other copies, uh, editions are coming out in other languages, Chinese and Arabic and French and Russian as well, for people in other parts of the world. So it's a great resource and an opportunity actually just to have a study group on one essay, bring together your friends and just talk about it 
and see if you can puzzle out some hard problems and use this as a jumping board, if you will, to serious thought about hard problems. You can catch Dr. Palmer speaking about Why Liberty as he travels to special events throughout the year, including Atlas's Liberty Forum and Freedom Dinner. Well, Tom Palmer is Vice President for International Programs at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. He's also a Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and Director of Cato University. And if you follow him on Facebook, you'll see photos of him as he travels throughout the world, some very uh, strange and dangerous places, speaking on the history of liberty and constitutionalism, on free trade and peace, individualism, public choice economics, and the moral and legal foundations of individual rights. This book, Why Liberty, is the fourth in a series of books aimed at young people, although I like them too, even. Previous books were titled The Economics of Freedom, The Morality of Capitalism, and After the Welfare State. In the opening chapter of this book, Why Liberty, Palmer writes, As you go through life, chances are almost 100% that you act like a libertarian. You might ask what it means to act like a libertarian. Well, it's not that complicated. You don't hit other people when their behavior displeases you. You don't take their stuff. You don't lie to them to trick them into letting you take their stuff or defraud them or knowingly give them directions that cause them to drive off a bridge. You're just not that kind of person. You respect other people. You respect their rights. You might sometimes feel like smacking someone in the face for saying something really offensive, but your better judgment prevails and you walk away or answer words with words. He also writes, you're a civilized person. Well, congratulations. You've internalized the basic principles of libertarianism. You live your life and exercise your own freedom with respect for the freedom and rights of others. You behave as a libertarian. Well, you can read this book online at either Students for Liberty or the Atlas websites. Or if you know a group of young people who would benefit from this book, and I think all young people would, these organizations will send you printed books at no charge. And by the way, I mentioned that Dr. Palmer is director of Cato University. This is a week-long program held each summer. I attended a few weeks ago, or a few years ago, I'm sorry, and it's an outstanding experience. You can attend as an adult, as I did, or if you are a college-age person or know someone who is, I would urge applying for an academic scholarship to attend Cato University. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. We hear a lot about how school spending in Kansas has been slashed. We hear that thousands of teachers and other school employees have been laid off, and we hear that class sizes are soaring. Can we take a look at the actual statistics and see what's really happening? Well, of course we can if we want to, and I've made a video to help out. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks. A recent op-ed in the Kansas City Star talked about budget shortfalls and teacher layoffs in Kansas schools. The writer stated, The continued shrinkage of K-12 school funding in Kansas has led to budget shortfalls, teacher layoffs, and program cuts. Let's look at the data. Here's the Kansas State Department of Education, which has personnel reports. When opened in the Excel spreadsheet program, the data looks like this. And I've gathered these spreadsheets for several years and consolidated them in Tableau Public. You can use this interactive visualization at the Voice for Liberty at wichitaliberty.org. The data we're looking at is for certified personnel. And this is divided into two groups. There are teachers and then others. Besides teachers, certified personnel include superintendents, principals, librarians, and nurses, for example. So what does the data tell us? Well, looking at all school districts, we can see that the number of these employees had been declining, but is now rising. Teachers are shown in blue, and the other line is all certified employees. If we look at ratios of these employees to the number of students, we see that for the entire state, the ratios had been rising, meaning that there were more students for each teacher and certified employee. But now the ratios are falling. By the way, a student-teacher ratio of 12.8 means there are 78 teachers for every 1,000 students. 
When that ratio rose to its highest value of 13.5, that meant 74 teachers instead of 78 for every 1,000 students. So these changes are relatively small. Also, the story is not the same for each school district. Here's Wichita. Its trend is similar to that of the state. Here's Kansas City. Their ratios have risen, which is opposite of the state's trend. For some of our other large school districts, here's Topeka. Ratios are falling. In Lawrence, the ratios are falling. In Olathe, the ratios have been steady. In Shawnee Mission, the ratios are falling. And in Blue Valley, the student-teacher ratio is falling, while the certified employee-to-student ratio is steady. In South Central Kansas, the ratios in Derby are rising, in Goddard they're falling, and falling also in Mays and Andover. Remember, you can use this visualization yourself at the Voice for Liberty, wichitaliberty.org. So, when you hear complaints about large class sizes, remember that student-teacher ratio is not the same as average class size. The numbers show, however, that employment in Kansas schools is rising in both absolute numbers and ratios of employees to students, although it's not the same in all districts. By the way, if you're concerned about class size, I'd urge you to become familiar with the research. The Center for American Progress has a good wrap-up of this, and it concludes that class size reduction is very expensive and produces only modest benefits, if any. So, we saw that employment levels were falling at one time, but for the past two years they've been rising. Both the number of teachers and the number of certified employees have been rising, and the corresponding ratios of students to teachers and other certified employees, well, they were rising too. But now they're falling. And it's important to remember that, as I mentioned in the video, it's not the same in all school districts. But in most districts, and for the Kansas as a state as a whole, employment in schools is rising and the ratios of students to these employees is falling. As I also mentioned in the video, these student-employee ratios are not the same as class size. But if school districts are able to hire more teachers, and if the student-to-teacher ratio is improving, but there are still high class sizes, what does that mean? Well, I don't have an answer to that, but I think we need to look at the management of school districts. No, if we want to inject politics into this, we would have to notice that at the time teachers and other school employees were being cut, our state had Democratic governors Kathleen Sebelius and Mark Parkinson. It's when present Governor Sam Brownback came into office that the number of employees rose. Now, there are other considerations and intervening incidents, such as the recession that happened at the end of the last decade, but the statistical record does not match what we're usually told. We've seen other examples on Wichita Liberty TV of how government school boosters in Kansas are either uninformed, misinformed, or maybe deliberately lying to us. They tell us that Kansas schools are superior to Texas schools, but we saw that when we look at disaggregated data, that Texas schools outperform Kansas schools in nearly every point of comparison. We also saw that Kansas, despite its claim of high student achievement, has very low standards compared to other states. It's the National Center for Education Statistics that says this, based on its analysis of national test scores in the states. And perhaps worse of all, right after the Kansas Supreme Court in 2005 ordered the state to spend more on its schools, and while the legislature was complying with that order, Kansas actually lowered and weakened its school standards. And again, that comes from the National Center for Education Statistics. Now, there are some very simple things that Kansas could do to improve its schools. Most importantly, it could implement school choice. This could be done through vouchers or tax credit scholarships. And another aspect of school choice is charter schools. But Kansas has very few charter schools because Kansas law says that local school districts must approve charter schools. And local school districts just don't do that very often. It's sort of like asking Burger King to approve building a McDonald's right across the street. Well, the Kansas school establishment says that all these forms of school choice drain money away from the existing public schools. But when the financial situation is looked at in states that have implemented school choice, 
we find that this is not true. School choice programs have been found to save taxpayers money. And school districts, well, they get to keep some of the revenue they receive, even though they may be teaching fewer students. Well, unfortunately, there are many special interest groups in Kansas, as there are in other states, that vigorously oppose any form of school choice. These groups are well-funded and know how to campaign and win elections. And in Kansas, our governor has not pushed for school choice programs, at least not publicly. And even with the shift in the Kansas legislature this year, school choice legislation was not able to advance. Some people have called school choice the most important civil rights issue of our day. That's largely because wealthy or well-to-do people, they can afford private schools or parochial schools, or they can afford to move to and live in the public school districts that they feel have good schools. Instead, it's poor students and minority students who are left behind. And even though most school choice programs that have been proposed in Kansas are targeted at poor or minority students, they are still vigorously opposed. The opponents of school choice programs like vouchers and tax credit scholarships say it is only rich kids who already go to private schools that will benefit. Well, that's simply not true. These programs are specifically targeted at those children who need them the most. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. As we record the show today, the United States government is in the third day of a partial shutdown. I don't know what the situation will be by the time this episode is broadcast, but it's quite a coincidence that Chapter 9 of Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt talks about government employees right at the time we're in a partial government shutdown. Let's have Amanda Billy Rock illustrate this chapter of Economics in One Lesson for us. Economics in One Lesson, Urban Style, just kidding. Written by the venerable Henry Hazlitt and retold by ABR. Chapter nine, connect the dots, yo. How many employees do you imagine the US federal government has? And remember, this is not including any state government employees. What do you think? As many as 100,000? 500,000? Should we get crazy and say even a million? Well, the truth is even crazier. It's 4.4 million employees. What do you imagine the payroll for 4.4 million people is? Especially considering the fact that public employees almost always make more than private employees working the same kind of job. I've done the math for you. The payroll is in the high trillions of dollars. And all the trillions come straight from the taxpayers. Do you imagine that some of those federal employees might be <clears throat> superfluous? No, couldn't be. Not an organization that's known for its thrift and adherence to budgets. Yeah, right. What if only an eighth of them were superfluous? 500,000. Well, some people say that we couldn't fire these 500,000 people because where would they get jobs? We got to look at the unseen people. If they were to be fired, the taxpayer money that was being used to pay them could be returned to the taxpayers in the form of lower taxes. The taxpayers could then afford to hire these people back into real jobs like McDonald's, Dell, Target, your local pet shop, movie theaters, law firms, hospitals, gas stations, Walgreens, Dunkin' Donuts, and your local GNC. But the good news doesn't even stop there. Not only would the private economy have more resources in the form of more cash, but the government workers who would now be working real jobs like the rest of us would increase production. And that all adds up to a better economy. Now you might be asking, Hey Amanda, hey Mr. Hazlitt, are you saying that the more government workers get fired, the better the economy gets? Well, what does my winking face tell you? Stay tuned for chapter 10. Well, you know how on a day when it's snowed or there's been a nice storm, you hear on the news that only essential government employees should report to work today. And when I hear that, I've wondered, well, why do we have non-essential government employees? Here's something that's a little shocking, and I didn't believe it when I first heard it this week. 
But the news agency Reuters is reporting that the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has decided that only 7% of its employees are essential. The others are non-essential, so why do we have them? And at the Department of Education, they decided that only 5% of their employees are essential and will come to work during the shutdown. How, I wonder, how are we going to educate children during this time? Well, do private sector companies have non-essential employees? Well, of course they do. But market competition provides a balancing force, a motivation to avoid waste. That's not present as strongly, or even maybe at all, in government. Now, I understand that we depend on government for so many things that during a shutdown, be it partial or whatever, people's lives will be disrupted. We're seeing news stories of people showing up at our great national parks, for example, and being turned away because the park is closed. Well, the solution to these problems is to take these products and services away from government and let the private sector operate them. That's something that may seem very foreign to a lot of people. Take the inspection of airplanes, for example. People right now are saying that if government inspectors are not available to inspect airplanes, well, they're going to crash. But ask yourself this question. Does an airline strive to operate its airplanes safely only to satisfy government inspectors, or does it wish to protect the lives of its customers and employees and safeguard its physical assets like the very expensive airplanes? Or consider a meatpacking plant. Does it strive to produce safe beef only because inspectors are watching or because it is concerned for its customers and wants to avoid the terrible publicity and economic harm of a recall? Well, I'm not saying that beef and airplanes should not be inspected, not at all. But they shouldn't be inspected by government because it's very difficult to hold government accountable. When we see episodes where government breaks down, such as perhaps government inspectors who might not be doing a good job inspecting beef, the proposed solution is always more money for government, more money for more inspectors, and more money for more bureaucrats. But what if we had a private market for inspection services? If there was then a failure of inspection, in other words, if a private inspection company was not being thorough, well, that would become known. The reputation of that company, which is its primary asset, would be harmed. No longer would we trust that company when it says the beef is safe. The company would likely fail, and someone else would provide these services. We can't really do this with government. To some extent, this is what happened during the financial crisis of 2008. The credit rating services were not owned by government, but they had a government-granted monopoly on providing credit rating services. And many say that their failure to produce accurate assessments of the risks of securities was pivotal in contributing to the collapse. Might it have been different if there was a free market for credit rating services? Well, we don't really know, but it might have been different. So this government shutdown going on is an opportunity to realize what we really need government to do and what can be better done by the private sector and maybe even what we don't need to be done at all. But it's a tough battle, though. Last week, Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House and Senate and House Minority Leader, she said there was nowhere to cut. Well, how about this? $325,000 was recently spent on a robotic squirrel named RoboSquirrel. This National Science Foundation grant was used to create a realistic robotic squirrel for the purpose of studying how a rattlesnake would react to it. Can't we cut this? I'm sure Nancy Pelosi would say, well, what would the scientific researchers do if we didn't fund this program? Well, we know as Henry Hauslett tells us, they do something else. Hopefully something else that the market, that is you and I, something that we value enough to buy it because we want it, not because government taxed us to pay for it. But we can't really see that right now while well, we do see Robo Squirrel. It's the seen and unseen again. But I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be so harsh in my criticism. We did learn that a successful rattlesnake attack on a squirrel involves three steps striking and hitting the animal, and that's usually from only about 10 inches away. Then, envenomating the prey animal. You know, the animal may try to escape at that time. And then the rattlesnake must relocate the envenomated prey animal after it succumbs to the venom. Envenomating. I'd never heard that word before. 
So maybe we really need to get government back to work after all. Well, thanks for watching this episode of Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, and I hope to see you next week.